Hello, good afternoon. I'm Diego Chiava and thank you for listening to me. Uh, today I will discuss about signatures of uh, low, uh, high energy Lorentz violation in non gaussianities that we might be able to see at the cosmic microwave background and large scale structure surveys. And these signals are of a kind that have not been discussed so far today. So you can find uh, what I'm saying to you in these two papers on the archive. So first of all, let me give you a lightning review of cosmological perturbation theory. I will just highlight some points that will be important for the uh, next part of the discussion. So we know that inflation comes with a theory of the seeds of structure that are the quantum field perturbations. And in this theory, there are observables. There are correlators of operators evaluated at a certain time. Here I'm using conformal time on a certain initial state. The formalism consists in evolving this initial state from its defining states up to the time the mm, correlator is evaluated and then evolving it back. This is the so-called in informalism. I will focus on scalar perturbations and uh, in particular on models where there is one prominent scalar perturbation, the commoving curvature perturbation, which is gauge invariant and conserve on super horizon scale. This of course occurs only if the, all the perturbations are adiabatic, for example, in single fields model of inflation. The basic building block of the uh, cosmology of perturbation theory and the computation of observables are the two-point functions, the propagators. This is, of course, because there is an analog of the weak theorem. In particular, they are called Wittmann functions. They are not time-oriented, and they can be expressed in terms of the mode functions for the commoving curvature perturbation. If I canonically normalize the field, the canonically normalized mode functions are this f of k, and they are related to the moving curvature perturbation mode functions in this way. One example of observables is this famous power spectrum, which is uh, essentially the um, Whitman function evaluated at very late time. But now let's move to non-gaussianities. Non-gaussianities occur when there are three and higher point correlators that are non-zero. And here things start to become interesting from wh what I want to say. The leading contribution in perturbation theory is the so-called bispectrum, the three-point function. And here you see its formula in leading order in interaction. And I point out two important elements of it. First, the interaction Hamiltonian, which of course needs to be there in order to have a non-zero uh, uh, bispectrum, but also this time integral from the initial time, I will take the standard adiabatic vacuum at infinity, up to uh, the time where I evaluate the bispectrum, which is usually a very late time. So this is a situation completely different from the power spectrum. In the power spectrum, I evaluate my correlator, which is a two-point correlator, just that it is at the, an instant of time. And actually, it's a very late one for observational reasons. Here, instead, I have a dependence on the whole uh, interval of time from my initial state, the vacuum at, let's say, infinity, very high scale, up to the modern time, the out-of-horizon inflationary time. This will play an important role. In the standard model of slow roll single field scenarios, that is, in any model where there are only adiabatic perturbations, the non gaussianities are hugely small. Now, we will preview, prove you that in the case of Lorentz violation, it's not like this. So the question is, can the non gaussianities be sensitive to Lorentz violation? And of course, everybody today has basically told us, yes, of course, in principle, they can, because when you have Lorentz violation, you will have a lot of new non-Lorentz invariant coupling, in particular cubic couplings in your action, and they can play a role. But unfortunately, these ones uh, are things that are not qualitatively different from the Lorentz invariant cubic couplings. They will be still very suppressed in a single field scenario. But there is another thing. When you have Lorentz violation, 99%, you have modified dispersion relations, which basically means modified mode functions, and therefore modified propagators. So the evolution of the fields in time is different. And the bispectrum oops, will actually depend on that, because indeed it's, it, uh, it includes an integral from the very initial time until the end. So what will change if I change the propagator through a change in the modified dispersion relations? So first of all, let's see what changes in the mode functions. This one is the standard Lorentzian uh, dispersion relation. Here is the frequency, and it's equal to k. I can parameterize uh, whatever general modified dispersion relations in this way. This one will be the Lorentz uh, uh, violation scale. And as you see, all the corrections are suppressed by this ratio. This one, 
is a cleaving order in slow roll, the uh, physical momentum with a minus sign. So, oops, the modified dispersion relations can be of two kinds. Uh, they can uh, strongly uh, change in time, or they can slowly change in time. In the second time, in the second case, they are called adiabatic. And you can study it, I did it, and you find that really there are no appreciable new results regarding non gaussianities But if adiabaticity is violated, violated, that is, these modified dispersion relations do change at least at a certain interval in time, quickly, abruptly with time, then what happens is that uh, the mode function gets much more complicated. You can study them with a variety of techniques, W3B techniques, uh, Taylor expansion in adiabaticity breaking parameters. They are all under control and the errors can be made small at will. So it can be very generic. I don't even need to fix a precise uh, dispersion relation to tell you what I want. What happens is that, in particular, there is particle creation. That is, now the mode functions will include both positive frequency and negative frequency components weighted by their Bogolubov coefficients. So what happens now? In the standard scenario, you use the standard um, Whitman function, the standard dispersion relations, and you have only positive frequency um, components. Then it appears that the non gaussianities uh, peak only at very late times, near horizon crossing, not before. So all the period of integration from the initial time until the very end is completely immaterial. It's only the very last part that counts something. And that basically tells you why the non gaussianity is very small. What happens when I have Lorentz violation scenarios and a non-adiabatic dispersion relations? Well, then the modification of the Whitman function uh, works in a way that non gaussianities are sizable also much earlier. So I have to cover the whole integral in a, in a uh, sizable way. You would say that particle creation must be highly constrained in order to avoid back reaction on the on slow roll, and that is true. But these um, constraints by back reaction simply means that your Bogolubov parameter will be small. It doesn't tell anything about instead the integral of the bispectrum. And indeed, when I have negative and positive frequency, they can actually interfere in the integral, and they can lead to enhancement effect. When there is interference, we have these peaks somewhere else. And the whole integral, since now it's all important, not only the last uh, stage of it, will give uh, uh, possibly a cumulative effect. So non gaussianities will hopefully, as we will see, become much larger. So let me, I will discuss two examples here. The first one is the non gaussianities in the CMBR, and by this I mean uh, with general wave numbers. And then I will discuss the squeezing limit, which is actually much more interesting from this point of view. I will give you one example, because I think that better than words, the example will illustrate what happens. So I take my simplest action, the einstein hilbert action. You can give me whatever coupling you want, and this effect that I show you, modulo some changes, will be there. So this is the formula for the spectrum that you obtain from this coupling, and you see you recognize the integral over time and the product of Whitman functions. If I plug in the Whitman functions with the more functions that I showed you, then I will have a sum of terms, each one weighted by powers of their Bogolubov parameters. I can study all of them, and I will, I'm presenting here to you the leading one. Uh, I, it's important, uh, I've written it in some kind of rescaled variables, but that doesn't make a big difference. It just captures better the physics. Here you will recognize the integral over time, and here you see that this integrand is the one of a typical uh, Fourier integral. There is a phase function which has large factor in front. So whenever there are oscillations, there will be strong oscillations and will dump the integral away. In the standard scenario, that's what happens because this phase function is always positive definite. There are only positive frequency components. In the non-standard Lorentz violated one, instead it's not positive uh, definite. And indeed then uh, there can be point configuration of the momenta, these wave numbers, let me speak, commoving wave numbers, kappa a, kappa i, uh, for which this uh, uh, phase will be strongly reduced. And this will, read, will lead, for example, to enhancement. When does these uh, oscillations uh, get stro gets strongly reduced? 
when there is a critical point and the presence of a critical point clearly depends on the kind of dispersion relations that you have. So I learn something from the pattern of law on the path about the pattern of Lorentz violation from my non gaussianity results. So let me give you what are the um, features, the signatures of Lorentz violation that you get in this way in the primordial spectrum. First one, there are enhancement that depends on the scale of Lorentz violation. Of course, the total enhancement will also depend on the value of the Bogle of parameter. Uh, this enhancement depends on the configuration and therefore on the dispersion relations. Actually, the enhancements are larger for higher derivative couplings, which again goes in the good direction for Lorentz violation, and there will be generally oscillations. Now, this is a picture. This is the standard result for the uh, einstein hilbert coupling, with, uh, and I've taken the simplest, uh, uh, at a certain moment, non-adiabatic uh, um, dispersion relations. So this is the standard, practically nothing. This is the Lorentz violating one, and you see that some configurations have a much larger level of non gaussianities Now let me go to the squeezing limit very rapidly. The squeezing limit is exactly the same stuff, the bispectrum, but one of the wave number is much smaller than the other two. This one is important because, uh, uh, if, for example, for observation of large scale structure, because the inverse of this small uh, wave number is basically the probe large scale. The nice point is that the squeezing limit is so extreme that it relies on very general features, not on tiny details of the models. So I can actually constrain and maybe falsify entire classes of models. So in the standard scenario, the leading co contribution to the squeezing limit is fully determined by general arguments that are encoded in the standard Whitman functions. The bunch Davis vacuum is empty, the dispersion relations are not evolving in time, and non gaussianities appear to, to peak only at very late times, as we said before. Then, because they peak at very late times, and I'm taking the limit in which K1 is very small, then the perturbation depending on K1 will be super horizon. That is, the product of K1 times eta modulus square will be much smaller than 1 at the peak time of production of ongashanities. It will be just a background, just shifting a bit the uh, exit of horizon times for the other perturbations. So, the final result is very simple. It depends for first, uh, the level of non gaussianity is hugely small, at best of order of the uh, slow roll parameter. It depends on the spectral index because of this background uh, feature, and it has a local form. That is, it grows like 1 over k1 to the cube uh, for small k1. The corrections are model dependent, and we will not focus on that. They are strongly suppressed. What happens instead when there is Lorentz violation? Now the Whitman function change. There is a different dispersion relations. And the non gaussianities do not only peak at late times, but actually even earlier. For example, at the WKB violation time. There are possible enhancements, as I told you, because there can be interference and accumulation with time. The funny part is that although K1 is very, very small, this is the squeezing limit, but of course it's non-zero because we are observing it, so it cannot be an infinite scale. Um, possibly at this time where the non-gashanities are already sizable because of the modified Whitman, fu Whitman functions, the perturbation may or may not be super horizon. So if it is super horizon at this time, at least we expect that, okay, there will be enhancement, but possibly the dependence on K1 will be the same as in the standard case. But imagine if it's not super horizon, then even the dependence on K1 will be completely different. And that's what we find. Again, let me give you an example. This is the same formula that I showed you before for the einstein hilbert cubic action. You re we recognize the phase function. Now, I don't look for critical point. Indeed, the, the squeezing limit is not a critical point. I just take the squeezing limit, and I find that the dominant contribution has a form. You see, this part of the formula for the squeezing limit for the uh, bispectrum is similar to the standard one. But the coefficient in front, that before was simply the slow roll parameter, or better, one minus the spectral index, now, if the perturbation was not super horizon at the WKB violating time, when there was Lorentz violation, then, as you see, it will depend in a non-trivial way on the small, the squeezed wave number K1. This was not present in the standard scenario. Again, for certain configuration, it will not only behave in a different way as a dependence on K1, but it will, it will also be enhanced. But what happens if, uh, 
in any case, the perturbation depending on K1 was super horizon at the moment of WKB violation and Lorentz violation. Well, in that case, uh, the spectrum will have a local form. That is, it will grow like 1 over K1 to the cube. But the amplitude of my bispectrum in the squeezing limit will be enhanced, much more enhanced with respect, depending on the Lorentz violating scale, with respect to the standard result, which was only this epsilon. So you can study, actually, you can actually make a comprehensive analysis using the effective theory for uh, single field inflation, or if you want, for adiabatic only perturbations. And what you find is that in the standard scenario, no matter what coupling you're using, uh, at leading order, the squeezing limit will always have a local form, k1 to the minus cube, a negligible amplitude, always of the order of uh, the given basically by the spectral index, and always, therefore, very, very small. What happens in stating the modified dispersion relations and uh, my K1 over Ks is basically the sensitivity that I'm probing the large scale scenario. This one, the inverse of this one will be the large scale that my experiment is probing, and this one will be the smallest scale that my experiment is probing. So this one is, let's say, the sensitivity of my experiment. So if this sensitivity is such that the perturbations that I can measure were super horizon, already at the time of Lorentz violation and WKB violation, then I still get a local form of the spectrum. So this is similar to the standard, but the amplitude is actually enhanced. So you see it's not order order epsilon, but it's enhanced by this part. And of course, it's then suppressed by the Bogolyubov of parameter. That depends on your model. But I will show you that uh, it's easy to get enhancement. If instead uh, the perturbation that I can probe in this, in the, in, by my experiments in this limit are such that uh, they were not super horizon at the time of Lorentz violation and WKB violation, then the spectrum is not even local. Not even if I only use, uh, in my low energy theory, I, I think that the others are too much suppressed, not even if I use only Lorentz invariant couplings, I get a local spectrum. The leading terms will actually go like 1 to over k1 to the fourth, not to the cube. And uh, if you're interested in higher derivative couplings, because when you have Lorentz uh, violation, you will have some kind of higher derivative couplings, because you have all kind of sorts of tensor structures, well, they actually grow even faster with, with a power n larger than 4. But the problem is that they will all be suppressed. So the overall picture is that if the probed uh, perturbation were not super horizon at the time of local of uh, Lorentz at the scale of Lorentz violation and WKB violation, I get not a local spectrum and not the same negligible amplitude. Let me give you an example with some numbers. I again take the Einstein-Hilbert cubic coupling. Why not? And then I use a set of parameters that are taken from WMAP, the, the more or less value of the slow lower parameters, the value of H in terms of n Planck. This is the um, Hubble rate. Then, for example, let's imagine that uh, my Lorentz violation occurs at a scale which is more or less the GAT scale, 10 to the minus 3 and Planck. Why not? And of course, I have to take into account the back creation constraint, which uh, act, which constrain my Bogolyubov parameter to be of this form. Then I cook up uh, the numbers, I crunch this number into my formulas, and what I see is that, uh, indeed, if I probe scales this x1 is k1 over k3, basically. Uh, at the time of Lorentz violation was super horizon, sorry, was uh, uh, sub horizon, then I get uh, a non-trivial scale dependence to my squeezy, squeezing limit, and also enhanced factor, at least for some configurations. If instead they were the probed um, perturbations were already super horizon, so I go to such large scale that they were already super horizon, at the scale when Lorentz violation was occurring, then of course I get a local spectrum, like I told you. Uh, this one is the standard factor, but you see, it's easy to get at least 10 times uh, larger non gaussianities in the squeezing limit. So let me summarize. We have shown that the three point function is sensitive not only to the fact that there are new cubic couplings because of Lorentz breaking, but actually in a mu much stronger way to the fact that the dispersion relations are modified. So the propagators, the Whitman function, the basic building blocks of my perturbation theory are modified. And we have found that such modification of the theory at high energy, that is, I have Lorentz violation at high energy, could lead to different shapes and enhanced non-Gaussianities, 
perhaps visible in the CMVR, or even non-local behavior and enhanced non-gashanities in the squeezing limit even, which it maybe will be visible uh, through large-scale um, structure surveys. Thank you very much. For a very quick question. So how much of the uh, enhancement of the bispectrum depended on any particular functional form for the dispersion relation past uh, the non-adiabaticity wavelengths? Okay. So all the computations that I've done are at leading term. Uh, you want the CMBR or the squeezing limit? Uh, the squeezing limit. Okay, the squeezing limb. So that's actually easier to answer that yeah, question. Yeah. So all the computation that I showed you here, for example, for the Einstein-Hilbert cubic action, Maldacena cubic coupling, uh, are leading order. So the leading order doesn't really depend on the tiny details of the model. That's exactly the same that occurs in the standard scenario with no Lorentz violation. Mm -hmm. The leading order is only determined by very general arguments. In this case, the arguments are particle creation, and a certain scale of Lorentz violation, lambda. The sub-leading terms, those will depend on the tiny details of the dispersion relations. There is only one configuration in which even the leading order depends on the details of the new dispersion relations. And this one is the so-called folded configuration, when the two large momenta, so K1 is very small, but these one are the two large ones, are parallel with each other. So in that case, you see that even the leading term depends on this kappa. And this kappa, I haven't shown you, but it's basically the first correction to the Lorentz uh, transformation. I hope you can see this. So I will have something that goes like k plus some coefficient, depending on, on the Lorentz violation scale, Oops. k to the kappa. So only for this configuration, even the leading term depends more strictly on the form of the Lorentz violation. Uh, sorry, uh, new Lorentz violating dispersion relations. For all the others, the argument, the argument is completely leading. There is no, no real way. I mean, there is a, a bit of dependence in this beta parameter, but they don't depend on K1, as you see. So the only strict dependence is just for that configuration, which maybe it's actually useful because you can measure this power from the data. Let's thank Diego again.